Well, everybody, we're going to give about another minute to let a few more people from the online audience log on, and then we'll get started with a few announcements before the election. Okay. Get started. All right. Well, thank, welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for the Massey Family Endowed Lecture at the Marine Biological Laboratory. Our speaker today is Matthew Botkinick, and we'll be joined by Stephen Backus and Xiao Jing Wang, the course directors of the Methods in Computational Neuroscience course. While we remain restricted to having a limited in-person audience, we are excited for this opportunity to bring pieces of the MBL Advanced Research Training courses to the public through the Virtual Endowed Lecture Series. This series is comprised of eight lectures throughout the summer for eight different courses. Over the years, generous friends and family have honored eminent scientists and loved ones with 26 endowed lectures at the MBL, and the series would not be possible without that support. If you're interested in learning more about this opportunity, please email development at mbl.edu. This is a Zoom webinar and will be recorded. All guests have been muted and we will have a dedicated Q&A session at the, Q at the conclusion of the lecture. So please submit your questions in the Q&A function uh, during the lecture. And without further ado, please welcome Xiao Jun Wang, course director of the Methods in Computational Neuroscience course. Good evening. Can you hear me okay? Um, so it is a great pleasure to welcome you to attend this year's uh, Walter Mises lecture. Um, I am a co-director with uh, Steve uh, uh, Bacchus for the Methods in Computational Neuroscience course, and this event is co-hosted by our course and uh, uh, Brains, Machines, and Minds, or Minds and Machines, uh, organized by Gabriel and Tommy. Um, who, um, uh, are present in the audience. So let me start by saying a few words about Walter Mazur, uh, whose family generously supported uh, this uh, lecture series. Walter Mazur was born in 1938 and grew up as uh, African-American uh, in the racially segregated Mississippi. He has had a, a very outstanding career as a theoretical physicist and educator and he also served a number of uh, leadership roles, uh, including the provost of the University of California system, the um, Institute of Art um, at, in Chicago, and director of the National um, um, uh, Science Foundation. Um, I think it's only fitting that uh, uh, this year's uh, lecturer is uh, uh, Matthew Botvinik, uh, because what he represents, as you will see, uh, really uh, reflects uh, what a measures uh, cross-disciplinary -discipl interests uh, in, in multiple uh, areas. So Matt is the Director of Neuroscience Research at DeepMind, an honorary professor at the Gatsby Computation Neuroscience Unit at uh, University College London. He uh, went uh, to Stanford uh, for his undergraduate studies, had his medical training at Cornell, and obtained his PhD at uh, Carnegie Mellon University. One, uh, in fact, uh, at that time, uh, CMU was really a powerhouse of cognitive neuroscience with people like uh, Jane McLellan and, and uh, John Cohen. Um, one of his uh, long-term research interests is uh, to understand how conflict is monitored uh, in the brain and um, you know, he has done a, a number of really uh, important work in that direction. Um, and he had, you know, had the faculty positions uh, at UPenn and at Princeton. Um, and he continued uh, in working uh, in this field as well as um, uh, several other very important areas, including hierarchical uh, reinforcement learning. Um, so I guess, um, you know, it is really, um, uh, a great thing for DeepMind uh, who, uh, that decided to recruit him to lead 
uh, neuroscience-related research uh, in the active mind. Uh, as you will see, um, throughout his career, uh, Matt has always combined experiment with computational modeling, and um, he's going to talk to us about uh, you know, his more recent work entitled Deep Reinforcement Learning and its Neuroscientific Implications. Uh, please join me to welcome uh, Matt. Uh, this is okay, thanks, Xiaoxing. Thanks so much. I'm just going to get a couple of technical things settled here. Echo. That's not, re that's not very promising. Testing, testing, testing. <laughs> Let's see if it's an adaptive system. Is it because of this? I don't know. Is it, is it just a question of making it further from me? All right, we did it. <laughs> testing, testing. Let's do system identification here. No, it's off. Or unless it magically came on. No, it's off. Can it, I guess I can just do that, yeah. They were saying it would be better for me to use this. I'll turn it off. Okay. Can, can you hear me? was no response, so I'm not encouraged. And I'm still hearing an echo. Anybody home up there? Hey, can you hear this echo? It's off, yeah. Let me make sure that my mic is off. Yeah, yeah. Testing, testing, testing. Oh, it's off. Oh, it's off. Okay. Okay. Any other suggestions? Testing. Testing. Test, 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 test. I want to go back to Zoom talks. <laughs> Testing? Echo. Echo. Just for fun, let me see whether this. Test, 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 test. test. No? Okay. okay. Test. Test. Sorry? 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 Yeah, I tried that. Test? Test? I'd love to start, but I really feel like it might be hard for people to hear. Maybe just, Maybe put, just turn, put, turn the speakers, speakers off, off in the hall. Test, 
Yes. yes. It's completely. Well, my computer is completely muted. Test, test, test. That sounds better. I'm not. I'm not. Has something changed? That sounds good. Good. Okay. I'm a little bit nervous, but let's go. All right. Um, Hi. Uh, <laughs> just to remind you, I'm Matt Botvinnik. Um, <laughs> I, I am really happy to be here. Uh, this is the first talk I've given in, per in person in a very long time, and it feels really good. Um, and it's really fun for me to be doing it at MBL. I've never visited MBL before, but I have been coming to Woods Hole with my family every summer for vacation for 20 years. Um, and in fact, my wife's family has been coming to Woods Hole for over a century. Um, I noticed that the reception after this talk is in something called the Meg's Room, uh, in honor of uh, Edward Meg's MD, and I'd like you to meet my wife, Amory Meg's, <laughs> who's related to Edward Meg. <laughs> so it's, a, it's, it's, um, it's nice to be doing this talk not from my home, but it is nonetheless rather homey uh, to be doing it here. So let's, let's get started. Um, I, I'm going to tell you right off the bat, I may go over a few minutes at the end, since we're getting a late start. I hope that's okay. I have a lot I want to tell you about. So let's dive in. Um, and by the way, thank you very much for resolving the technical issue. I really appreciate that. So yeah, I want to talk about deep reinforcement learning. Um, uh, let me explain what that is, uh, and then I'll explain why I want to talk about it. So it will come as a surprise to absolutely nobody here uh, when I say that there's been a, an absolute explosion of progress in the AI world um, over the past uh, 10 years or so um, uh, involving the use of deep learning or artificial neural networks. And this, of course, began in 2012 with the famous uh, breakthrough application of convolutional neural networks to image classification data. Uh, and after that, just absolutely mind-blowing progress almost every day, uh, leading up to uh, the, what we're seeing most recently, just as an example, um, this work from OpenAI, a system nicknamed Dolly, that can take uh, natural language inputs uh, and then generate images um, for which the inputs are reasonable captions. So you just enter an illustration of a baby daikon radish and a choo-choo walking dog, and it spits out those images. Just truly, truly amazing stuff. Um, of course, again, as everybody here will well know, after uh, the breakthrough in 2012 with deep learning, neuroscience uh, um, turned again to, to, to artificial neural networks in earnest as models of biological neural systems, beginning what I view as a real renaissance in, uh, in that kind of work. Um, I'm just showing here two figures from now iconic papers, the, um, the work by Yeamans and DiCarlo, let me hide this little thing. Um, um, oh, great. I guess I can't hide it. The work by, oh, I can. The work by Yamans and DiCarlo using convolutional neural networks to model ventral stream neural uh, receptive fields uh, and uh, work with recurrent neural networks um, by Monte and colleagues modeling the activity dynamics of prefrontal neurons. Many of you know these two pieces of work. I call it a renaissance, and I, I use that term advisedly because. Um, uh, this kind of work really does very concretely pick up uh, a stream of research that began really 20 or 30 years ago. Um, and the connections are immediate. So if you look, for example, at the Amons and DiCarlo work, which was published in 2016, there's very similar work that was done as early as 1988. Um, work by David Zipser, for example, using backprop nets to, uh, to uh, understand the receptive fields of parietal parietal neurons. And if you look at the, the, uh, the Monte Cicillo doll um, work with recurrent neural networks on prefrontal cortex, again, you can find very early work using recurrent networks to model prefrontal dynamics. Um, so really, it is a renaissance. Uh, the, the work that we're seeing now really does pick up a tradition uh, that began you know, back uh, when I was a grad student. Um, and in fact, even on the AI side, if you look at the, um, the techniques that are driving progress, very often you can find that their immediate precursors were, were introduced quite, quite some time ago. So for example, convolutional neural networks were first trained in uh, the late 90s. 
and the, the generative models and uh, language modeling techniques that are involved, for, for example, in Dolly, were already um, under direct investigation, very much in their, like, something like their current form in the 90s. Um, so, I mean, of course, there have been all sorts of advances in deep learning techniques, but really, the, the, the magic um, behind most of what we're seeing now is um, driven simply by the fact that we have much larger and much faster computers that allow us to uh, train much larger systems on much more data. And so what we're seeing is, in a way, the payoff that uh, people back in the 90s kind of expected was gonna be there once we could get to this point. Uh, doesn't make it any less exciting, uh, and doesn't mean that the people doing the work deserve any less con uh, congratulations, but it really is um, sort of uh, the same road. What I wanna talk about is something that is newer, something that really has only come into existence over the past six years or so, uh, and it's something that I actually think is of greater significance to neuroscience, uh, and it's something that's received a lot less attention from neuroscientists, and that's why I wanna talk about it, uh, and it's something called deep reinforcement learning. So with apologies to those of you, and I'm sure there are many who are very familiar with deep reinforcement learning, let me bring everybody on board by explaining what I mean by this term. So deep reinforcement learning is simply the bringing together of deep learning and a, another computational paradigm referred to, surprisingly, as reinforcement learning. Uh, what I mean by reinforcement learning is a particular learning problem. The learning problem is you have an agent that is making observations of an environment, it can emit actions that affect that environment, and the agent is supposed to learn how to behave adaptively in that environment, and that means choosing actions that maximize a reward signal. The critical difference with supervised learning, which is what most deep learning uh, research involves, is that the training setup does not involve exposing the learner to the correct answer explicitly, but instead simply involves giving the agent this scalar value, which tells it how good uh, the outcome was from the action that it just took. Um, as many of you know, this, this is a big difference. Uh, this means that the agent has to do some things that learners in the supervised setting just don't have to do. Um, the first is reinforcement learning agents have to discover the solution. They're not told the right answer, and so they have to try things out and see what works. Uh, they also face an explore-exploit dilemma, which means that even though, even though they might have some information about what works in their environment, they can never be sure that there's something else they haven't tried that might even be better. And so they have to keep exploring, but of course the more knowledge you have, the more sense it makes to just exploit the knowledge you've already gained. So there's this kind of trade-off that you have to manage as you go along if you're an RL, if you're a reinforcement learner, uh, between those two options. Uh, and then finally, even though it's not part of the definition of reinforcement learning, it's been traditionally a focus of RL research uh, to look at environments that require sequences of action to get to a goal. Uh, and that'll be important in, as, we, as we go along. Okay, so I wanted to go through that definition because I think a lot of neuroscientists think of RL as defined in terms of an algorithm. But it, it, it's actually, if you look at the foundational documents of the field, it's defined in terms of a learning problem. Of course, as again many of you will know, there are a family of algorithms that have emerged uh, in the RL literature that seem to be particularly useful, uh, and some of them are particularly relevant to neuroscience. And one that I'm gonna keep coming back to uh, is called temporal difference learning. And for those of you who haven't uh, encountered this before, I think the lectures are tomorrow, uh, at least in the, the computational neuroscience course. So I'll just give you the gist of this. Um, the basic idea is that the agent maintains some estimate of how good its current situation is, and then it goes ahead and emits an action, sees how well things turn out after that action, and it compares that outcome to its initial, its a priori prediction, and computes a, a surprise signal, a reward prediction error, uh, and then that surprise signal is used retrospectively to update the value representation, so the next time the agent is in that same situation, its, its uh, prediction is more accurate. Once you have a good value function, then you're in a pretty good position to choose good actions because you can look at which uh, the, the value is, that you associate with each available action in any given situation. So that's temporal difference learning in a nutshell. This broad family of algorithms is not new. Uh, it was first introduced actually in a way that was inspired by animal learning research back in the 1980s by Rich Sutton and Avi Berto. But for most of the history of reinforcement learning research, there was an important limitation that, uh, that really kept uh, RL uh, implementations from being as interesting as they could be, especially to neuroscientists. And this has to do with 
representation. So for, uh, for a, long, a, a long time after these algorithms were, were, um, uh, became a focus of research, they only really were applicable to very simple representations of the current state of the environment or the agent. In the extreme, these were discrete orthogonalized representations either of space or of time. Uh, and even though there were slight enrichments of this, it was very hard to build systems where representations of state had interesting similarity structure. It was hard to build systems where the representation of one state could resemble the representation of another state to some interesting degree. And that's a real problem if you want your learner to generalize what it's learned to unfamiliar situations. How do we generalize? We look at some new situation, like the one we were just facing with the echo, for example, and we think about, we, we, we represent that situation in terms of its resemblance to things that we already know about. Um, I was a little out to see with the echo thing, but I had some theories about what might be causing it, uh, and that's because I have this rich representation of the world that admits to similarity, that, that includes similarity structure. RL algorithms were not applicable in that domain for a long time. People had thought that maybe combining reinforcement learning with deep learning might be an answer because deep learning systems do have rich representations of, their, uh, of the data uh, of the world that they're encountering, and those representations do have rich structured similarity structure, so maybe we could combine these two things. And there was a, an, exciting, um, an exciting piece of work in the, in the, um, in the 90s uh, that seemed to show promise uh, because uh, Jerry Tassaro was able to combine temporal difference learning and deep learning uh, in order to play backgammon. But it turned out to be very difficult to, to use the same techniques he used in other domains. And people actually had concluded that it might, in general, be impossible to make this combination work. Until, quite recently, 2015, this was the shot heard around the world in DeepRL, just the way that the uh, ImageNet stuff was the shot heard around the world in deep learning. Um, this is work from DeepMind. I can't take any credit for it. It happened before I arrived. Uh, but the idea here was that deep neural networks trained with reinforcement learning uh, showed um, that they could reach superhuman performance on this suite of classic uh, Atari games. The setup was super simple in retrospect. It was just take a convolutional neural network of the kind that had been applied to, to ImageNet, feed into it an image, which is just the pixel-based uh, um, uh, image on the screen in the Atari game, and then uh, on the output end of the network, you have the actions that the player can take in these Atari games, joystick actions. But instead of telling the network what it was supposed to do in any particular situation, you do the temporal difference thing. You let it compute a value function, the value associated with each action, uh, and then you update that and make those predictions better using um, reward prediction errors. And uh, that's what made the whole thing uh, work. And there were a few kind of tricks that, um, that made the whole thing stable in a way that the TD Gammon work was not. Uh, and those few uh, innovations allowed for a, an explosion of um, further developments in, in DeepRL, which have defined the field ever since. So just some examples of these. Um, in um, quite famous work, David Silver and colleagues, also at DeepMind, uh, and again, not involving me, uh, augmented the, um, the neural networks uh, that were computing value functions with, um, with a look-ahead uh, mechanism, a tree search mechanism that allowed the system to refine its estimates of how good uh, each situation looks by doing a little bit of forward search based on a model of the domain. And this is the combination that led to these famous breakthroughs in uh, the, the, the ancient board game of Go and chess, and it, I assume many of you have heard about that. Um, in, in work that involved my colleague Greg Wayne, who I'm very excited to see live after a year and a half, um, uh, the, again, the, the neural network uh, um, uh, agent, so to speak, was augmented with a different kind of additional structure, which is something like an episodic memory. This is a slot-based memory, a little bit like a RAM in a computer, uh, that can store vectors and then retrieve them in order to support reinforcement learning. And it, this addition uh, allowed uh, um, deep reinforcement learning to attain to interesting forms of uh, relational reasoning, for example, searching this uh, family tree. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other stuff. So taking these techniques and applying them in multi-agent domains, for example, capture the flag uh, or StarCraft, um, continuous control and robotics tasks uh, like this uh, Rubik's Cube demo from OpenAI uh, and this very recent uh, soccer work in simulation from uh, colleagues of mine at, at DeepMind. Um, okay, so that's, that's deep reinforcement learning, but I want to talk to you about why I care about it not as an AI researcher, but as a neuroscientist. Um, 
So why, why do I think that deep, deep reinforcement learning is potentially important for us as neuroscientists? Well, there, there's an easy answer, which is just that we already know that deep learning is relevant, and we already know that RL is, is relevant. The, I mean, I've already talked about the intimate relationships between deep learning research and neuroscience. Of course, deep networks were invented as models of neural system, biological neural systems, but you know, now we have 30 years of research showing that it can be useful to use them as models in detail. Um, uh, I haven't mentioned this yet, but many of you will know that there's also a very intimate connection between RL algorithms on the one hand and things that we know about brains on the other uh, that involves dopamine. So um, back in the 90s, uh, um, uh, Peter Diane colleagues uh, established this very fascinating connection between temporal difference learning signals, in, in particular the word prediction error signal on the one hand, and phasic dopaminergic signaling from the VTA on the other. And the basic idea, in case you're not familiar with this, is that dopamine, uh, a lot of what dopamine does in, in, in brains can be understood as reflecting reward prediction error. Uh, and its effect downstream is understood in this theory to be um, uh, uh, through the influence on synaptic change. Uh, and the influence of that synaptic change is to improve value estimates else, that are maintained elsewhere in the brain, for example, in the ventral striatum. So again, many of you will know that. Really not hard to argue that deep learning and RL are relevant to neuroscience, but I think there's much more to this. So for me personally, I think there's something special about the combination of deep learning and RL as computational frameworks. And I say this because of what these, frame, what these computational paradigms are really fundamentally about. So I think it's fair to say that deep learning is in some sense about representation. Uh, about re-representing uh, the world in a way that's useful. Um, it's about knowledge. Uh, and it's about cognition. Um, RL, on the other hand, is about motivation. It's about value. It's about uh, conation, which is sort of about goal-directed, motivated behavior. For me, if you put those two things together, you cover a lot of at least what I would like to understand about the brain. I think this, this is kind of what the brain is for. It's about establishing representations of the world and then using those to pursue goals, like that seems to cover a lot. In fact, if you just look at any instance of intelligent behavior, it's hard not to interpret it in terms of those two things. Uh, what's, what does the dog think is going on? What does it know about water? Uh, and what does it want? Obviously, it wants that tennis ball. My, this isn't my dog, but my dog spends a lot of the day doing this. Um, and you know, uh, philosophers of action and agency have, have codified um, intelligent action in very much those terms. So I, with that in mind, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give an alternate title for, for the rest of my talk, and uh, maybe this will be a little controversial, but I'm just gonna come out and say it. This is what I think. The brain is a deep reinforcement learning system. I think that's what it is. Um, and I'm gonna try to unpack that for you. Now, I hasten to add that uh, I'm, I'm applying deep reinforcement learning as a model of the brain, and of course all models are wrong, uh, but some models are useful. And so really what I wanna convince you of is not that, that this is correct in every detail, but rather that it's useful. Um, that's what I'll take as my task. So let's think about how deep RL can be useful. One, one way in which it's useful is simple, which is that it puts us in a mode of building agents. Um, a, an agent is just a system that, that takes in perceptual observations, emits actions, and lies in a closed loop with a dynamic, causally structured world. And once you, once you have that, you have a system that really needs to deal with all of the problems that living, embodied uh, organisms have, uh, but we get to do it while also thinking about how, about what's under the hood um, using, the, using the language of deep learning. So what do I mean by all the things that agents have to deal with? Well, they have to control their bodies. These are um, uh, deep RL experiments with um, realistic uh, mouse and fly bodies in, built in a physics engine and then uh, um, expressing control policies learned through deep RL. Um, they have to learn how to deal with spatial navigation. Uh, these are figures from a, a nature paper from my colleague Android Benino and colleagues um, uh, from 2018, uh, where they showed that in a deep, deep neural system, uh, they could explain not only how grid cells emerge, but also why they're useful, like why they actually help uh, systems deal with uh, like obstacles and, uh, and, and spatial planning problems. Um, agents in general have to deal 
with, uh, with, with situations that require reasoning, as in the work by Greg and colleagues that I mentioned, and planning, as in the, um, the AlphaGo work. And uh, at least humans have to deal with other humans, um, interacting with them, coordinating with them through language. So if you were lucky enough to hear Greg's talk uh, at the MCN uh, earlier today, you'll know the work that he's been doing in that area. So we get to put it all together in that way. Um, and DeepRL gives us a way of doing that. And with the growth of computing power, you know, we may be getting to a point where we might be able to build agents that are kind of on a scale, on a similar scale to actual brains, which is, which is a really exciting prospect. Um, why is that? So, of course, that's fun, uh, but why is it important? Let me give you two reasons. The first is captured in this paper. If you've never read this paper, go find it online and read it. It's like, I think it's one of the most important papers ever published in cognitive science, um, even though it's very old. Uh, and this is, um, in this paper, Alan Newell makes the case that psychology, which is the field that he was addressing in this paper, will never be cumulative unless we can somehow bring it all together, unless there's some medium within which we can bring together put under one hood all of the little piecemeal observations we're making about human behavior. And I think the same holds true uh, for neuroscience, and DeepRL might give us a kind of laboratory for doing that. At a more detailed level, um, there's another point which relates specifically to learning. So there's classic work that had a big impact on me as a graduate student, but actually by my thesis advisor, David Cloud, um, but also involving Dave, Jay McClellan. Um, and and it, it was about um, reading. It was about uh, deep neural systems that map from orthography and spelling to phonology, or, or the spoken sounds of English, of language. And, but the point that the, the word, word work made was that the, the kinds of internal representations you get that map between these two domains uh, turn out to be different depending on whether or not you include in the same system a, a separate representation of word meaning or semantics. So the, the, the high level point here is that in systems that learn, it can really make a big difference what else is going on in the system during the learning process. So that really should make us cautious about taking a fully divide and conquer approach in neuroscience. Sure, things are sort of modular to, to an extent, but we want some place where we can bring things together. Uh, and DeepRL gives us a framework for doing that. Now, this kind of interaction principle during learning in DeepRL, it plays out between representation and value. So we get to think through DeepRL, through a DeepRL lens, about how the representations that a system has structure its goal-directed action. And we also get to think about how the system's values or goals can end up shaping its internal representations of the world and how these things all fit together in some sort of um, uh, loop. So this, this gets me to my final point about um, why I think DeepRL is, uh, is cool for neuroscientists. And, and that is, you know, I, I introduced it by saying, oh, it's just a combination of RL and deep learning. But, but what I want to say now is it's actually more than that. Because once you build systems that bring together deep learning and RL, Things happen, interesting things happen that don't happen in deep learning on its own in a supervised setting or in RL with more impoverished state, uh, representations. So I wanna give you a couple examples of that and here's where I'll start diving into some actual research. Um, but I'm gonna go fast because I really just wanna give you a flavor of what I mean rather than like give you the details of uh, particular research or projects. This is the paper I'm gonna talk about, all the details are there, uh, but this is a study in which we um, looked at uh, something called distributional reinforcement. So um, I've already talked about value representations and, and um, or prediction errors. In traditional TD learning, both of these things are scalars, right? They're just numbers, single numbers. Uh, in, uh, in distributional RL, um, people had been, sorry, I forgot the build here. Let me just say this first. So in the traditional case, uh, you've got an Atari game, the agent is looking at that screen, its value estimate is like a little bit less than 24 points. Um, that's how many points it thinks it's gonna get in the future given that situation, it's just a single number. Okay, yes, so now, in distributional RL, people were trying out something different, which was letting the agent represent the value and the reward prediction error instead as a distribution. So now the agent can say, well, I, you know, I think given the current situation, maybe I'll get something like 22 points, but I could get 28 points, a whole probability distribution over future cumulative reward outcomes. And what was observed empirically is that that really helped. The agents learned a lot faster and they ended up performing a lot better just with this uh, representational change. 
This already represents an example of the, you know, deep RL being more than the sum of its parts principle, because you don't see this effect in RL agents that use, say, tabular representations. I can explain why if people are interested in that afterward, but I'll move on uh, to the neuroscience part. So why is this useful? Well, if it really helps in artificial agents, who knows? Maybe the brain hit on the same idea uh, and is exploiting it in order to make us more efficient uh, learners and better performers. So how would we, how would we um, uh, test that out? Uh, well, we can look at dopamine activity because there's already this very firm connection, we think, between uh, what we see in phasic dopaminergic activity in the VTA, or at least part of the VTA, and the reward prediction error. So let's go look at those reward prediction error signals and see whether they look like traditional reward prediction error signals or the ones that you expect to see in a distributional TD system. Um, so in order to pursue this, we teamed up with Nawachita, who I'm also delighted is here. Uh, he had data from a, a study with uh, mice where mice got a cue saying a reward is coming, but not telling the, the mouse how much juice it was about to uh, receive. And then the mouse was surprised to receive one of seven uh, volumes of juice. And when, um, when, uh, when now in his lab recorded from VTA neurons, uh, and then just took the average over all of the dopamine neurons that were recorded, they saw a very traditional looking RPE signal. So when, the when a lot of juice was delivered, the, the dopamine neurons got excited. When less than average juice arrived, the dopamine neurons were disappointed, a negative reward prediction error uh, as signaled by a dip in activity. But that's the aggregate signal. What we needed to do in order to test the distributional hypothesis was like go under the hood and look at the, the, whether there were differences across the population of dopamine neurons. So one prediction is that different dopamine neurons should have different tuning curves. They should respond with different slopes in terms of their, their spike rate responses to different juice magnitudes on the positive side and the negative side. So some neurons should be re, show, show a really uh, steep tuning curve in the positive RPE domain relative to the negative, and others should show the opposite kind of kink in their tuning curve, and then there should be a whole spectrum of kinkiness in between, and that's exactly what we saw when we looked across the population of 40 some odd neurons. This is just a sample of the whole thing. There were several other predictions that we tested there that came directly from the algorithm. One is that different dopamine neurons should, if you will, flip from a negative RPE response to a positive one, should change from a dip to a, an increase at different reward values, at different juice volumes. Uh, and that's what you see in an artificial distributional TD system, and uh, that's what you see in the neural data. Those two things, the kinkiness of the tuning curve and the point at which the neuron flips to a positive RPE, those two things should be correlated according to a distributional TD account. Uh, and then most sort of transparently, there was one more prediction, which is that if the brain is really representing the reward, uh, the reward distribution in this experiment, that is to say, if there is a distributional representation of the outcomes for these mice, then we should be able to look at the population of dopamine neurons and decode that. We should be able to just look at the way that the dopamine neurons uh, respond uh, without, you know, without, without knowing what the set of reward values was that the animals actually um, were exposed to and infer what that set of reward values was. And what you're seeing here is the outcome of that kind of inference process. The gray uh, bumps here indicate the true reward distribution and the blue curves represent the inferred reward distribution just based on a readout uh, from the dopamine neurons. The fact that there are multiple curves here is just multiple runs of an optimization algorithm with different initializations. Uh, and this is just very different from what you would see if you tried the same inference procedure if the brain was really operating in the traditional, uh, the traditional way. So the fact that we see a multimodal distribution here at all is, uh, well, was pretty shocking to us when we first obtained that result. And I think it's pretty strong uh, evidence in favor of the hypothesis that the, that the dopamine system is using a distributional code. Um, since we published this paper, uh, the Kennerly Lab in London has, uh, has found a highly parallel patterns of activity in the prefrontal cortex. Um, and uh, we also have a paper under review about what the relevance of all this might be to um, to computational psychiatry, which I'd be excited to talk to people about, uh, maybe at the reception if you're interested. But for the moment, let me move on. Again, the point here is just to give you examples of why I say deep RL might be useful and why deep RL is really more than the sum of its parts. 
So let me give you another example. Again, a kind of bird's eye view of a project. Uh, this is a paper that we published um, in 2018, uh, and it's about prefrontal cortex. So here we drew on this tradition of modeling prefrontal cortical activity using sort of embarrassingly simple recurrent neural networks. We've already touched on that. Um, recurrent neural networks, of course, are very uh, common building blocks in uh, AI systems and deep RL systems uh, as well. Um, you can see them living inside two agents I've already mentioned. Um, when, when we use recurrent networks in deep RL systems, uh, we've come to recognize that something really cool and surprising can happen if you train those agents in a multitask environment. So let me explain it um, in a simple setting. So imagine you have a recurrent neural network and that, that network is serving as a, a deep RL agent. It's taking observations of the environment and emitting actions. And it's trained with an RL, RL algorithm that is adjusting the connection weights inside that recurrent network. And now, as I said, we're going to train the network in a multitask environment. What I mean by that is, imagine we train the network on a bandit task, two arm bandit task, with a particular pair of reward parameters. We train it on that task for a while, and then we give it a new task, which is a draw from some distribution of bandit problems. We let it train on that for a while, then we give it a new task, and a new task, and a new task. So we're training this, this one network on a distribution of interrelated tasks, a family of tasks. Now, the cool thing that happens is, if you train in that setting for long enough, you can turn off reinforcement learning. You freeze the weights in this system, and then you give it a new bandit problem. And lo and behold, when it's presented with this new bandit problem, it learns. And you can see this in its actions. So this is sort of a raster-like plot showing a, an agent choosing the left action, then the right action, then the left action, and then deciding that the right action is the best one, sticking with it. Down below is a harder bandit problem where the agent has to explore for a little while longer. You can come up with a, a, an aggregate measure of how well the agent is doing in these bandit tasks by looking at cumulative regret. Uh, and what you see is that this little recurrent neural network is competitive with off-the-shelf machine learning algorithms for bandit problems, um, even though its connection weights are completely frozen. It's like a brain where the synapses are not allowed to change their, their efficacy. So how is this possible? Well, it has to be that the network is using its activity patterns and the dynamics of its internal activity uh, as a learning algorithm. And you can see this in action if you, do, if you take the patterns of activity that, as they arise inside this neural network and do dimensionality reduction, as, as was discussed at least in the, the, um, the, the methods course today, uh, to visualize how those internal uh, patterns of activity are evolving. So uh, on the left you see a PCA analysis um, of an, a trained agent with its weights frozen, uh, dealing with a bandit problem where the correct action is on the left. And you can see its, it, its, its activity kind of tracking toward an, a, an attractor that lives so on the left side of that plot. And that, that same agent faced with a, band, a, a different bandit problem where the, uh, it's the other action that's more valuable, tracks to a different attractor basin. And, uh, and if the problem is hard, you can see it sort of vacillating uh, between the two attractors and ultimately settling into one. Um, so, uh, so what's going on here? This is a great example of deep RL being more than the sum of its ingredients because you really wouldn't see this kind of uh, phenomenon uh, without bringing these two ingredients together. What's happening is reinforcement learning is training the weights in a recurrent neural network, which in turn are giving rise to network activity dynamics that are implementing their own completely separate emergent learning algorithm. This is why we called it meta-reinforcement, this meta-learning process. Okay, so why is this of interest to neuroscience? So um, uh, we, can, we can follow the crowd and just interpret this recurrent neural network as a very coarse model of the recurrent uh, activity um, uh, that we see in, a, in prefrontal cortex circuits. And of course, we've already talked about how the reward prediction error signal uh, is, um, uh, is thought to be carried by dopamine, so we can interpret the RPE signals in our little model as reflective of what uh, the dopamine system should be doing. But when we bring those together, what we're, what we're really in a position to study is how does dopamine-driven learning give rise to prefrontal dynamics that themselves implement a learning algorithm that's completely separate from the original uh, reinforcement learning algorithm. Um, and then we can use the resulting system in order to try to make sense of phenomena in neuroscience. So we studied a lot of them in this paper, but I'll just give you a quick example. Um, we looked at bandit tasks that monkeys had performed in a study by Tsui and colleagues. Monkeys had to decide which of two visual targets to look at, 
and they had to decide which one was better by discovering which one was rewarded most often. And the reward schedule that was used in this study was one where the best policy was not to just figure out which was the richest uh, target and then just stick with it, but instead to do something called probability matching. Um, and that just involves sort of allocating behavior in proportion to the rewards that you harvest from the two options. Uh, so we train a recurrent neural network on a family of tasks uh, uh, of the kind that Susui and colleagues had trained um, monkeys on. And we find that with the weights frozen in this recurrent neural network, we see probability matching, which is already pretty cool because there are a whole bunch of papers in the neuroscience literature proposing very specialized mechanism that must, mechanisms that must exist in order to give rise to probability matching in animals. But in this simulation, nothing special is needed. We just used an ordinary RL algorithm and meta-RL gave rise to this, to this policy. But we can do more because Sasui and colleagues gave us EFIS data to look at. Uh, and so we can compare that with what happens in turn in, inside our little model prefrontal cortex. So Sasui and colleagues reported that DLPFC neurons seem to encode for a small set of obviously important variables, including what action is the animal about to select, what are the estimated values of, those, of the two actions, and importantly, what's the history of action selection and accompanying reward. Um, they reported the proportions of DLPFC neurons that coded for each of the variables of interest. And when we looked inside our little NetRL network, we found that the, the artificial neurons there were coding for exactly the same things and sort of surprisingly in the same proportions. So perhaps meta-RL is a good explanation for the prefrontal, or the, for the emergence, as well as the form of the prefrontal activity that Susui and colleagues observed. Okay, so the paper um, from which this comes then goes on to study a whole bunch of other uh, neuroscientific phenomena, um, offering to explain them through a meta-RL, um, uh, with a meta-RL story. Just to give you a flavor of this, uh, uh, the paper addresses dynamic learning rates in dynamic environments and how those are controlled by prefrontal activity. Uh, it looks at some interesting aspects of reward prediction error signaling in the, in the dopamine system, explaining why um, certain studies have identified what's called inferred value signals, where dopamine uh, um, updates its behavior based not on, re on observed reward, but instead on some obvious knowledge of the structure uh, of an overall task. Um, the paper also addresses uh, data from Nathaniel Dawes' lab, another person who I'm really glad is here, uh, showing that um, reward prediction error signals in the brain uh, show um, signatures of model-based RL, something I, I, um, I, I hope he'll be covering tomorrow in his lecture. Uh, and then finally, we, um, we modeled some classic behavioral data. This is uh, a figure from a, the first psychology study that ever used the term learning to learn. Uh, and the basic idea in the study was that monkeys were presented with a task that I won't describe, but they were very poor at this task to begin with, but then after a bunch of experience, uh, they could be presented with new stimuli in the context of this task, and they would show one-shot learning. Uh, you know, they would, like, after one experience, they would be at ceiling in their performance on the task. Uh, and the idea here was they had learned to learn. They had learned the overall logic of the task, and that allowed them to quickly make sense and make the right inferences about new stimuli. So the, I, I emphasize this because it leads to kind of like a bottom line description uh, of what's going on in, in meta-learning, including our meta-RL work, which is that you can see fast learning requiring very little data as a result of, as an outgrowth of slower learning that requires lots of data. So you can have slow learning processes that are very data hungry that can nonetheless give rise to other learning mechanisms that are fast and frugal. It's a good way of explaining what meta-learning is. And the reason I really hammer that point is I want to turn now to a couple of con like concerns that people have raised, especially in the cognitive science literature, about deep learning and also deep RL in particular, and try to kind of ease your mind about, about them, um, if you are. So um, the first is from uh, a, a, a very um, lovely study by Brendan Lake and colleagues, where, where this came out shortly after the Atari work that I mentioned, and the concern raised there was, look, these deep RL systems are really cool, but they're not human-like because they learn too slowly. They require too much data. Humans learn really fast. In fact, in this plot, you see learning curves for the, the um, Atari agent alongside the performance uh, of Brendan Lake himself on this Atari game. Uh, and you can see Brendan's really fast. 
Uh, and so the, 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 the inference we're supposed to make is, oh, DeepRL is wrong as a model of, of human learning uh, because it needs too much data. But hopefully uh, what I've already said can show you the way out of that bind. Uh, if we bring meta-learning into the picture and we understand that fast learning that requires very little data can emerge even in deep, deep RL out of slow learning that is very data hungry, then we're okay. Because then we can say, well sure, Brendan Lake's fast. He's got all this previous experience with other video games and the visual world and polar bears and all that stuff. And he just brings that to bear. Now, you might say, wait a minute. What about children? Because they're fast learners too. And by definition, they haven't been around very long. So they haven't had a chance to sop up enough data to really make that story fly. And I'm sorry, but I think the answer there is much more obvious than is reflected in many debates on this issue, and it's evolution. <laughs> evolution is a slow learning process that requires lots and lots of data. And it sets up your brain so that you're a fast, efficient learner. So don't forget this next time you get into an argument with uh, somebody, uh, um, with a developmentalist who wants to convince you that there's something special going on here. So yeah, I mean, it's fun to think about how much data evolution consumed. I mean, eyes uh, came into existence about 500 million years ago, so how many frames of video have been consumed uh, since then? Like how, many, how much video was consumed in setting up this child's visual system? More, vi more, more video than is on YouTube, which is a lot. Uh, so I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page about that. Um, now, you can, you, deep RL does give us ways of bringing in e evolutionary uh, mechanisms. They're not, they're, they're kind of like a research topic. They haven't proved to be hugely practical so far, but they give us a way of maybe experimenting c computationally. Um, and, you know, uh, Tony Zader just published this really interesting paper about how we might take insights about the genomic bottleneck and bring them to bear in, uh, in neural network research. I recommend that paper if you're interested in this topic. There's also a really cool paper by uh, Satinder Singh, uh, uh, Rick Lewis, and Andy Bartow about how reward functions themselves might come out of evolution. But having said all this, I do want to admit that evolution, in my view, is like the one area where deep RL doesn't really cover what we would need to cover to understand the brain. I mean, there's a lot about the influence of evolution on brain structure and function that really has to do with like, incidental aspects of natural history or, uh, or you know, things like uh, the fact that the brain has to fit through the birth canal. So, you know, I, I think it is important to acknowledge that this is an area where important things that we want to understand about the brain, deep RL might be less useful. Um, but let's come back to its defense. So another way in which deep learning and by implication deep RL uh, has been critiqued uh, is, uh, again, um, has been very clearly expressed by Brendan Lake and colleagues. And here are, the, here are the concerns about representation. So the idea is the world is compositional. Human intelligence, at least, capitalizes on that compositional structure. If I showed you this weird vehicle, you might, you might detect yourself understanding it by bringing to bear little bits of knowledge you have. You know what a unicycle is like, you know what a motorcycle is like, you know what a segue is like, and you're putting those together compositionally, like pieces that relate in, in ways that are guided by your knowledge in order to understand that thing. If I showed you this new uh, character, this new glyph, you could probably figure out how it would be produced uh, with a pen, uh, and that guides your interpretation of, of its structure. And um, uh, so Brendan and colleagues uh, propose that deep learning probably isn't gonna be able to handle this sort of compositional inference and this kind of compositional representation and other kinds of models are going to be needed in order for us to really get our heads around that, including some very structured uh, probabilistic inference models. I think that this argument is getting harder to sustain in the face of systems like this. I mean, if this isn't compositional understanding, I don't know what is. Uh, but in fairness, things might be harder in an RL context. So, it's one thing to understand the compositional structure of images. It's another to understand the compositional structure of, a, of video games, to, to understand the way that video games usually work, the way, the fa the, what the sprites mean, how they tend to move, how they tend to interact, what their causal relations tend to be. And it's that kind of abstract background knowledge about video games in general, which is highly compositional, that explains Brendan's amazing performance on uh, Frostbite, uh, and it is admittedly something we want to understand. I'm totally on board for that argument. In fact, I really recommend this paper that just went on archive from um, the first author is Pedro Savides, but it's some of the same authors uh, 
uh, and they, they, they put their finger on like some really important aspects of human intelligence in the reinforcement learning domain. And it's really about this kind of compositional understanding of the causal world. And they use this term theory, that, that reinforcement learners, like us, build theories of the world. And this is a term that's drawn from uh, the developmental psychology literature, where it's been proposed that children build theories that are almost like scientific theories about the way the world generally works. And then they can understand new situations because they can bring those theories to bear uh, in a compositional way uh, to make the right inferences. So I'm totally on board for that. The question is, can DeepRL handle that? And um, so we actually concurrently have been doing some work that addresses this. Uh, and the answer, I think, is kind of interesting. So we developed a video game for DeepRL agents called Alchemy. And the basic idea is the agent picks up these stones and dunks them in potions. And the potions have these transformative effects on the stones. And the stones are worth different values. And the agent has to plop stones in that cauldron. And it harvests the points when it does that. And the, the, the point, obviously, is to transform stones into more valuable forms and then plop them in the cauldron to maximize your score. But the catch is that the chemistry changes. So every time you play the game, the chemistry is different. So you have to be a chemist. You have to do experiments and figure out what the chemistry is this time in order to know what to do, in order to know how to transform these stones into the most valuable forms. Now, there's a generative process that underlies the instantiation of the chemistry. So the chemistries are draws from a well-formed well distribution uh, that involves the shapes of the stones and their values and the effects of the potions in transforming them one to the other. But the combinatorics are such that the space of possible chemistries is large, uh, and so really, the only way to be good at this game is to do something like this, is to really develop a theory of this domain, to really understand the generative process, at least in some kind of implicit way, so that when you're faced with a new chemistry, you can do the right experiments in the right order, because you know what, it, it, like what, the posterior, what the structure of the posterior distribution is, how to update your knowledge based on observation. Um, OK, so how do deep RL uh, agents do? Well, one nice thing about this task is because we know the generative distribution of the task, we can say what optimal performance is exactly. We can build an ideal observer agent. It's not a deep RL agent. It's very costly to run. It computes the posterior explicitly and then chooses actions that are optimal for that. Uh, but we can do it. And uh, that's the score that it gets. So how does a deep RL agent do? We took a, a state-of-the-art deep RL agent off the shelf. Um, a VMPO agent, for those of you uh, know and care, uh, and it does terribly, horribly. And in fact, that dotted line indicates chance performance, meaning that the agent's just picking up stones and dunking them randomly. In fact, you can see it doing that here. Uh, we, we played a trick on the agent and just gave it all yellow potions, which all do the same thing, and it's just happily dunking this stone, which doesn't change at all. It's just not getting it. It doesn't have a good theory of this task. Now, the picture changes completely if we take that same agent architecture and we give it some, a, an additional input which just exposes the current chemistry. It just involves a kind of vector representation of the current chemistry. So this is privileged information. We're, we're giving the agent the answer about what the current chemistry is. And when we do that, its score is great. So we know that the problem is not with planning, right? It, there's no problem sequencing actions. If the agent is told, here's the chemistry, it can maximize its score. The problem is really this. It's this theory building thing. It's like exactly what Pedro's talking about. The, the agents are not like over many experiences building an abstract model of how this task generally works that guides their experiments when they're faced with a new chemistry. Um, now, it turns out there is something that you can do that fixes the problem. Uh, but I'm not going to tell you what it is because I want to, right now, because I want to get there indirectly. So um, let's come back to this Dolly work. One of the things that's really, one of the innovations in deep learning that allowed this result is the creation of new classes of deep learning architectures. And these are architectures that build in inductive biases that favor compositional processing. So the, 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 the one that was involved in the Dolly work is called a transformer. Greg talked about this in the, in the methods course today. And you don't really have to know the details for the purposes of this talk, except to know that the inputs to the system are a set of vectors. So the, the architecture immediately assumes or implies that the world should be carved up into a set of discrete entities, and then 
Computation involves looking at the relations between those entities, and it also means that there's, uh, there's an inherent support for uh, what psychologists call a type, uh, a type token distinction. Uh, so this architecture was developed for language processing, where, the, where these tokens are obviously going to be words, and the type token distinction means I can handle it if a sentence involves two occurrences of the same word. I understand the difference between a class of an object and instances of that object. Um, this architecture allows you to com you know, compute compositionally in an easy way. And it's, transformers aren't the only architecture that, that does this. Uh, they're, they're, they're also graph nets, which are closely related. But the point is, we're now, one of the real innovations in deep learning has been the development of these architectures that do kind of favor uh, a, a compositional form of, of processing. Okay, so transformers were actually used in this work that I briefly mentioned in DeepRL uh, to play out of this game StarCraft at, at, um, at superhuman levels. And in that work, the, the tokens, the, the uh, discrete uh, inputs that uh, were used were not words, but they were visual objects, which is pretty natural from a, a neuroscientific point of view. We know from tons of research that whole objects are a natural unit of selection for the visual system. Um, I wish I had time to tell you about this amazing classic study, but I'll move on and just leave it at that. I'll also mention just briefly that on the AI side, there's an increasing set, uh, an increasing um, set of available deep learning techniques for just going directly from images to segmentations, just automatically pulling out the discrete objects that make up a scene. And this can even be done in an unsupervised manner. So one natural approach to compositionally structured tasks with visual inputs is to just take an architecture that has this inductive bias toward compositional processing and use objects, which can, which can be discovered in, a, in, a, um, in an unsupervised way, as the inputs. Um, in, we're going to bring this back to DeepRL in a second, and then I'll wrap up. I'm, I, as promised, I'm going to go over by maybe five minutes. Uh, so if, if anybody has to leave, I won't be offended. Um, right, so I'm going to come back to DeepRL in a minute, but I'm just going to dwell for a moment on the power of this combination uh, in uh, visual inference tasks in general by telling you about a paper um, uh, led by my colleague David Ding. And the idea here was to use an architecture of this kind in tasks that had been introduced specifically to challenge compositional inference in deep learning systems. And all of these tasks actually had been introduced with the argument that they probably required something more than deep learning. They probably required neurosymbolic techniques in particular. And, uh, and one of these tasks is a, a, a video question answering task called Cleverer, um, where you can see objects are moving around, and then questions are asked like, you know, what event will happen next, or counterfactually, without the gray object, which event will not happen. Um, a second task is called Cater, which is again a video question answering task here. Uh, it's a little bit like a shell game. This little shiny thing that they call the snitch uh, gets uh, hidden, and the, uh, the, the question that's asked at the end of the video is, where's the snitch? Um, and then a third task uh, uh, is called Acre. Some of you will know the classic work by uh, Alison Gopnik in Developmental Psychology, where she probes causal learning and causal understanding with something called blicket detection, where an object is put on a box, and if it makes the box play music, then it's called a blicket, and children have to kind of determine what makes an object a blicket. And this was inspired by that, and you, you, you can probably get the gist of this by just looking at these images. Uh, certain objects in certain combinations will light up a box, and the agent has to figure out, like, what, you know, what is it that's going to make this box light up? So David just took a very simple approach, took a transformer, fed in objects that had been uh, um, pulled out of the frames of video using these unsupervised learning techniques in, ta in, in the task where there was also a a, a language-based question, you just fed in the words as additional tokens. And that very simple approach yielded state-of-the-art performance on all three of these data sets, um, and in general, much better performance than the neurosymbolic systems that had been proposed as probably necessary uh, um, over and above uh, deep learning. So, so it turns out that if, if, you, if you have the right inductive biases, if you, if you carve the world up in the right way, uh, then you can get pretty far in the direction of compositional processing and inference with the tools we already have. And in fact, that's true in DeepRL too. So 
it turns out that if you take the, uh, the agent that we started with that did so terribly, and you just give it inputs that are represented at the levels of discrete objects, and it goes through an architecture that favors compositional processing, it does fine. So DeepRL, not every version of DeepRL will do this, but there are versions that will, uh, and that's, uh, that's, um, that seems like an important insight. One other thing I wanna mention though, so, and I'm, now I'm gonna come to my closing comments, but a couple more things I'll, I wanna uh, uh, lay on you. So, another important ingredient in that result that I just mentioned is something called an auxiliary task. So, in, it, it's a very common thing in training language models uh, to have uh, a training signal that's task specific, like you're, during training you present the answer to the question, uh, but alongside that to have another learning, uh, another, another task that's driving learning, which isn't about the task specifically, but it's just there to encourage the emergence of rich representations. And often this, in, in, in language models, and in David's work, this is something called a self-supervised uh, uh, um, objective. In, in this case, you remove one of the objects and you make the system guess you know, what's in the spot that you just cleaned. Right? It's kind of like fill in the blanks kind of uh, thing. So I just want, you can do this in RL too. So I've, I've only mentioned RL as the signal that drives learning in deep RL agents, but that's, that's really not what we do anymore. Um, there are systems that only use the RL loss to drive representation learning. In fact, the, the Atari system that I started with was that way. We, we tend to call that end-to-end -end learning, end-to-end -end RL. But in fact, that's very rare in practice these days. And what you get instead is systems with multiple objectives. So this um, navigation system that I mentioned in brief early, earlier, this uh, Benino Nature paper, had an RL loss which guided the agent's navigation, it, it guided its navigation, its, uh, um, its learning of navigation tasks, but it also included a self-supervision task, just a, a prediction task that led to the emergence of those grid cells that were useful for the RL task. So one thing I want to make sure that, uh, you know, that I communicate is when I say the brain is a deep reinforcement learning system, I don't necessarily mean it's an end-to-end -end RL system. There's plenty of room for multiple objectives, and that's maybe one of the most interesting things about deep RL. I also want to make clear that when I say the brain is a deep reinforcement learning system, I don't mean it's a backprop system. Now, it is true that we tend to use backprop in everything we do in AI, and it works unreasonably well, but we all know that there are certain things about it that it's not obvious how the brain would do that, and even if it could, probably wouldn't want to do that because there are interference effects in backprop that are annoying. You train on one task, and then you go to train on another task, and intermittently you check back on the first task, and it's forgetting the original task. There are ways around this. You can re replay memories the way the brain does, and that helps a lot. Um, there are ways of modifying backprop, for example, in elastic weight consolidation, uh, um, which some of you will know about. You can protect those already formed memories. But there are also other learning algorithms that we might come up with that lead to rich representation learning, and maybe they'll be less susceptible to catastrophic interference. Uh, we just put a paper on archive that describes a novel learning algorithm that has some of those properties uh, and has a, an interesting biological uh, uh, interpretation. Check it out if you're interested. But um, let me just close. So, so this is the thought I really want to leave you with. Um, but I'm in a position now to add a little bit, of, a little bit more nuance because the, I've said the brain is a deep reinforcement learning system, but now you, from everything I've said since then, it's clear that there are lots of deep reinforcement learning systems. So this doesn't tell you which deep reinforcement learning system the brain is, and there are lots of things to figure out, like what is the structure of the data that leads to the representations that we find in the brain? What is the architecture that carries the right inductive biases? What are the objectives that drive learning? Clearly RL is one of them. What are the others? What are there's, there's self-supervised learning that, that um, gives rise to useful representations? What does that look like? And what exactly is the learning algorithm? None of these questions are answered by my original assertion. And so what I really want to say is, the brain is a deep RL system, and neuroscience is about figuring out which one. And that's, that's kind of my way of looking at uh, the neuroscience that we do. Um, okay, so hopefully, if nothing else, I've convinced you that deep RL might be useful uh, to us as neuroscientists. Um, this has been a bit of a whirlwind tour of my thinking on the matter. If you want to dig deeper, hold me accountable for anything I said, a lot of it is in this paper that we published in Neuron a while back. 
uh, and I just want to quickly just acknowledge all of the colleagues who worked on the work that I concentrated on. Of course, there are many, many, many more um, that I didn't have room to show here. And thank you very much for sticking around. I don't know the protocol. Do we have time for questions? Do we go right to the reception? Yeah, we'll, we'll move to the uh, question and answer portion now. So if you're an online participant, uh, please uh, put your question in the Q&A. And if any of the students have questions, uh, Matt, you're free to answer them uh, in the auditorium. Um, and we should use the microphone, I guess? Yes, please. Awesome. Thanks, man. Really cool talk. Um, I just want to go back to this this one comment you made about like when you were covering Brendan's stuff, when you mentioned, you know, like we like people have this notion of what pixels mean in like a game, right? And like, you know, also going back to the stuff with David Plout and like, you know, how you have this notion of semantics, right? So going back to that. I'm going back a lot, I guess. Going back to that kind of nice divide you show where, um, you know, deep deep learning kind of gives us representations, uh, gives us knowledge, gives us concepts, and on the other side you have like RL that's about value. So um, I just want to push you and like maybe it's like a broad question, but what where, where do you think this notion of semantics or meaning falls in the system? And, you know, where in that kind of continuum does it arise? Ooh, um, I hope that makes sense. <laughs> hmm. Um, well, I, have a, I, I, don't, I don't have a direct answer, but I have a couple of indirect, um, maybe I have a couple comments. Yeah. So one is, um, sometimes I get into conversations with people about whether, whether uh, AI systems need concepts. Um, and I have learned through painful experience that the best thing to say at the beginning of a conversation like that is, what is the behavior that you're interested in? What do you want the system to be able to do? And then we can talk about what the underlying mechanisms and representations might have to be. I think talking about, like starting with a psychological construct, like concept, is, is n not helpful, honestly. Um, and I, I suspect I would, well, I'd be tempted to give the same answer when the question is about knowledge. Um, but but on, on, a, on a less dismissive side, um, there's been a lot of debate uh, recently among AI researchers, and, and I'm sure among psychologists and neuroscientists too, about these large language models that, are, that have been a very big focus of the, you know, the AI world over the past um, year or two. And one question that often comes up is, do these systems really understand what they're saying? And you know that's always followed by some example, you know, where where the system makes a mistake. And um, I mean, actually, now that I'm into this, you know, part of my answer, I realize it's going to be the same as the first part. Because really, what I want to know is, like, what do you want to see from this system, right? Um, now, uh, I part of the debate has been about whether it's possible to understand the world in a language-only setting, right? So. You know, I, 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 think, I think in that case, I'm more interested in systems that have multimodal inputs because I think we can gain new knowledge by interacting with the world, whereas it's harder to gain new knowledge from the closed system of language. Um, but yeah, in the end, it all comes down to behavior. So, so I, I guess knowledge would be reflected in the ability to go from, to do very sophisticated credit assignment. That's my best answer. Right? You, you should be able to make an observation and make as many valid inferences as possible based on the structure of the world. That's a good definition of knowledge. Uh, and then the, the, the trick is to cash that out into actual tasks, both in AI and, and, and in, in the lab. Uh, and that would be my answer. What, what we need under the hood, it, like, I don't know, just train the thing and see whether it can do it, and then we'll talk. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for the great talk. Uh, I was curious whether there's been any uh, recent developments in using uh, DeepRL for modeling um, uh, psychiatric disorders that affect the dopamine system uh, that have very complex behavioral patterns, such as ADHD and whatnot. Mm. Um, 
there's, there's not a lot. Uh, I, I'm, I, there may be other people here who know this literature much better than me. Um, even though I uh, trained originally in psychiatry, I, I can't say that I've kept up assiduously on the computational psychiatry literature. There is a lot uh, that I am aware of using reinforcement learning uh, to model psychiatric disorders. And it's a fascinating literature, but just like everything else in the psychiatric literature, it's full of ambiguity and contradictions, and, um, uh, but very worth looking at. And, and it makes me hopeful that these computational tools will be useful. Um, I think I mentioned briefly, we actually have a paper under review, uh, which is applying deep RL to at least one psychiatric disorder, which is um, depression. And, and the, the, so just in a nutshell, the proposal there is um, based on an, an observation from uh, Tony Grace's lab uh, in Pittsburgh, uh, uh, which is that in, in the normal brain, there's always a subset of VTA dopamine neurons that are kind of sleeping. They're like quiescent. And at least in animal models of depression, which we hope are valid models of you know, clinical depression, the, the proportion of dopamine neurons that are quiescent in that way is increased. Um, and so in this paper, we, it's a speculative proposal, but there are like other reasons to, there are ways of motivating it beyond just what I'm about to say. But imagine that you're talking about a brain in which the dopamine system is coding for value in a distributional way, and the neurons that are falling silent are biased toward neurons with a particular tuning curve. So one thing I, one, one, one thing I didn't mention in my quick presentation of distributional RL is you can think of different dopamine neurons as um, sitting somewhere on a spectrum from optimism to pessimism. That's essentially, computationally, that's what's going on. Some do dopamine neurons really have rosy predictions about the future, and some dopamine neurons have really uh, um, depressive uh, predictions of the future. So now imagine that the dropout that Tony Grace describes only affects the optimistic neurons. You'd be left with a brain that uh, has a bias toward pessimistic evaluations of, of the current situation. So this was our, our speculative proposal. It turns out if you, mod, if you implement a model like that, you can explain a lot of what you find in the, um, the, the other literature that I mentioned before, which is fitting RL models to the behavior of people with depression in laboratory tests. So I think like, that's the only study I know of, and it's not published yet, uh, that uses deep RL for psychiatry. But I, I mean, I think it would be a great, a great thing to explore further. Hi. Uh, is, is, I have a few questions. Uh, so I'll start with the simpler ones uh, and then get into the more complicated ones. Uh, first question. Uh, is the goal of using deep RL to understand how or why the brain functions the way it does? Let's say, let's say, let's say not, actually, let's take it to like down to brain region, uh, or why a brain region or how a brain region functions the way that it does. Uh, the point of applying deep RL in the way that I've proposed is to build models of brain function. And that is, I'm using the term there exactly the same way that people traditionally use the term model. Uh, um, and what, what is that? Well, it, it, models are supposed to explain uh, what it is that they represent. They're supposed to expose explanatory principles that make you feel like you understand more about your, the, the, the modeled system. Maybe that means you can make predictions about that system or control that system in ways that you couldn't. Um, and there's a second sense of model, which is that uh, it's a surrogate. Right? This, is what, this is the term people use in, in, in like, an, I just use the term, an animal model of depression. Right? That means I can study this thing can make interventions there and see what happens and at least have a story about why that gives me new information about the system I'm really interested in, but I can't intervene there the way I'd like because those are people and I can't put electrodes in their heads. So, uh, so deep RL does both of those things. Um, and otherwise, I, I think it's pretty, pretty much after the same thing that neuroscience is always after. Does, does, I don't know if that answers your question, though. Uh, I guess the reason why I asked that question is because you kind of built your talk off of Jim DiCarlo and Danny Emmons' work, or at least that was the first part. Yeah. Uh, but the complicated part about that paper is that they used RSVP, 
uh, which is not necessarily how we see. Uh, uh, okay, things. so okay, so let me let me just make a couple more comments about that. I mean, one thing that's really cool about doing deep RL research in AI is that you end up having a lot of conversations about the training data, because so much of what you get out of learning depends on the richness of the training data. Right? And so if you want a generally intelligent agent to come out of the training process, it, it's like you, you have to have really rich training data. Um, and so you, I think, in a way, AI forces you to think more deeply about the ecological structure of the, you know, of the environment than neuroscience does. Because neuroscience is only responsible for probing the system, right? Where RSVP is fine. There's nothing wrong with RSVP as a probe to find out things about the, the system as it exists. But it's not the data that went into training the system or, or, or for which evolution designed the system. That, that's, that's the way I would look at that distinction. I don't think there's anything wrong with using the RSVP. But there might be something wrong with training your network. Um, yeah, maybe that's enough said on that. You, you had, you're, you're, you're relinquishing the microphone. <laughs> okay. I, I have more questions. We can talk, we can talk more sure. later. I'd be interested. Uh, thanks, Matt. Um, I have a question with regards to kind of in another direction. So some of the breakthroughs, as, as you mentioned at the beginning, and I many people are aware of have to do with the hardware, right? Like kind of the GPUs and the gigantic data sets and all that. It's my impression, I'm not an expert in RL, but that training RL requires a lot more hardware and a bunch of TPUs and a thousand GPUs for like really, really sophisticated experiments like the breakthroughs that DeepMind has been doing. So I wonder if... Uh, you think at some point um, this framework, while very theoretically interesting and relevant, is going to hit a wall in terms of the type of hardware that we need, mm -hmm. and like maybe five years from now it's going to be like, uh, like we're stuck and we should pivot and start doing something else. So it's kind of an open question. I don't know if you've yeah. thought about, this. especially uh, for academics, right, that maybe don't have the access to, or like an undergrad just playing with his ideas. Like Krzyzewski probably didn't have all that. Maybe now he does, but yeah. ten years ago he, he, he does didn't. Now. So um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I have a multi-part answer to that. So, so, like honestly, I like people sometimes come up to me and and at, at meetings after I talk about stuff like this and and kind of cop a bit of a hostile attitude, as if as if well, it's fine for you guys to talk about that because you have all these resources. And I'm like, well, yeah, okay, like you know, some research takes a lot of equipment, kind of like you know, satellites and linear accelerators. I, I don't know why that's so horrible, um, but. Uh, but I do have two things to say beyond that. Um, one is, I, I want to point out that the two studies that I presented as really most informative here uh, involve very small, so like tiny systems. Like there would have been no problem doing that work in an, in an academic neuroscience department. Like it, trivial. Like you could do it on a desk. And it was done on a desktop. So there's plenty of important work to be done at small scale. Uh, especially in a neuroscience context. Now, having said that, I want to come back to the point I made about the data. Because I think the last few years have shown pretty clearly that some of the most amazing things that deep learning can do only really happen at scale. Uh, and that really is not that surprising, you know? I mean, I remember I remember my, my, my office mate at CMU when I was a grad student was like trying so hard to scale up the, the language corpora that he was training his, his neural networks on. Like, because he knew, he knew that it was gonna, like the more, the larger the training corpus, the more interesting the behavior, you know, and I'm sure he's looking at um, the, the, language, the language models that are coming out recently and like nodding and smiling, because this is just like kind of obvious stuff. So there is probably a lot of stuff that is important and fundamental that is only going to happen at scale. And all I can say about that is, thank God we have these systems. And maybe instead of worrying about why industry has these systems and academia does not, maybe we could get the federal government to fund resources for academia. Wouldn't that be great? Um, you know, maybe we can come to see these kinds of computational resources uh, for neural modeling the way that we see linear accelerators. I don't know what the prospects of that are, but 
but I, that's something I'd love to see. And I, I think there is actually an initiative along these lines. Maybe some of you know about it by now. Anyway, that's my political statement for tonight. Hi, Matt. Thanks uh, for the talk. Um, I have a kind of two-part question. The first part is that um, I wanted your opinion about this, that do you think there is any relevance uh, from the sort of deep RL model or point of view to have specific tissue mapping of, of the models to the brain, which makes it easier for the neuroscientists to then go and test some of the predictions directly in brain data? And sort of the related question is that usually I found that, so he was mentioning about Jim's work, um, RSVP data is very easy to collect in monkeys, whereas some, some of these learning experimental data collection is really challenging. Do you see in future some of these learning experiments where re, uh, large scale data can be collected um, for, for, for directly guard railing some of these models, optimizing them on the brain so that they can mm. be sort of like constrained to work like the brain in some sense or human brain? Thanks. Um, Let me think now. The, uh, uh, jog my memory. The first part of the question was about. Um, maybe, maybe reframe it. Oh, the, uh, right. Uh, maybe sorry, reframe it slightly. It sounded like deep reinforcement learning is like venture stream of the visual system yeah. plus VTA. Yeah. How about the rest of the brain? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. So, I, I mean, I. I So I showed you our little fly, our little um, realistic fly body, right? And, and uh, the brain in that fly is nothing like a fly brain. It's just a recurrent neural network. And so a natural thing for us to do, especially because we're collaborating with people at Genelia, is to constrain the topology of the network, like make it look like a, brain, uh, uh, a fly, um, like use the fly connectome, right? Um, that would be really cool, right? And the, the, but it's tricky because, because we would be training that system with back prop on an RL problem, which is not the way that flies learn to fly. You know, there's like, there are these incommensurabilities. And despite all I've said about the usefulness of deep RL for neuroscience, I think like you have to be, you have to, you know, and it also relates to this question about our RSVP. Like you have to think hard about whether you're doing something that really is apples to apples or whether you're, uh, you know, um, uh, faking it, right? And so I, I'm sure that there is some version uh, of using uh, connectomic data that's really scientifically substantive. But I think, I think it would be, you'd have to arrive at the setup very carefully. Now, on, on, on a larger, uh, like at the larger, at a coarser scale, um, and this is sort of like in the terms that you just uh, introduced, Sergey. So, you know, okay, we've got ventral stream, we've got VTA, what about other, now we're talking about like whole brain regions, right? There I think there is more, I, th I think it's a little easier to, to make progress. So for example, uh, before I joined DeepMind, my, my research focused on prefrontal cortex. And uh, understanding what prefrontal cortex does, like if you give a, if, you know, if I gave my lecture on prefrontal cortex, I would talk a lot about neuropsychological findings, what happens when you damage prefrontal cortex. And understanding what happens in that context, really, like, it's very useful to appeal to the distinction between automatic versus controlled processing, or between habitual behavior and non-habitual behavior. Um, it's, you know, I feel like there isn't much that we really firmly know about human cognitive neuroscience, but I, I, I feel comfortable saying it's pretty well established that there's a habit system, and that the prefrontal cortex is important for overriding habits in order to show context-dependent behavior. Like, I feel pretty solid on that. And I even, I even feel pretty solid in explaining how that, what the underlying mechanisms are. I, I think I could, you know, based on some, of, some work that my, my colleague back at Princeton, John Cohen's done, based on some of the work that Jar Zing has done, and others, I feel like I could show you some models that I, I feel pretty good about, like, as, Models of how context, about how representations of context override habits. What I couldn't tell you, because the literature doesn't really say anything about this, is why. Like, what's the normative account? Why does the brain have this distinction? Right? Why don't you just, like, express every behavior in a context-dependent way? Why do you need these habits? Why does that exist? It doesn't exist in the Atari DeepRL system. 
we'd have to add additional machinery for that. So now you can imagine a program of research where you say, well, what would it mean to take a deep RL system, give it a habit system and a control system, and how would you train that up, and why, if, if at all, would it help? And actually, it turns out there are some really interesting developments in deep RL that I think give you some leverage on that, which have to do with default policies and regularized policies uh, in deep RL systems and transfer. I can, this is, that's a topic for the, for the reception if you want to hear more about it. But yeah, I mean, I think at the level of coarser brain organization, yeah, I think there's a lot we can do. Yeah. Hey, um, Matt, do you mind, maybe you can take a look on the chat. Um, if uh, in case someone is still around virtually uh, and uh, you want to answer one or two questions. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, apologies to... Hey, Matt. Uh, if I could chime in here, uh, we, we don't have any questions from the virtual audience, unfortunately. All right. No offense taken. Um, <laughs> do we have any time for, for more in-house questions, or should we adjourn? I'm up for anything. We should, we should move on to the reception? Uh, thank you again, Matt. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Justin. <laughs>